Father Cosmas joined St. Peter and Paul Church in Glenview, Illinois as a full-time youth director, a position he held until 2019. He was ordained to the Holy Diaconate in October of 2015 and to the Holy Priesthood in March of 2016. He will be joined after the presentation um, by a panel uh, who I will introduce to you right now as well so we can just jump right into it. Um, Tomaida Hudanish serves as director of the missions and evangelism ministry of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco, having previously worked for eight years in parish ministry. Tomaida has also worked on a number of international projects and is the co-founder of Beauty First Films, publishers of a unique liturgical season's wall calendar and creators of a forthcoming documentary about Saint Amphilochios of Patmos. Dimitri Gagianis, a recent graduate of Ohio State University, is a gra recent graduate. He currently works as a clinical specialist for Medtronic, a medical device company based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dimitri is a former OCF College Conference East leader. Along with Christina Anderson, uh, from whom we will hear more tomorrow, he co-hosts the podcast Siroc Meech and Teens on Ancient Faith Radio. Kira Limbarakis is director of the Crossroads Summer Institute and assistant director of the Office of Vocation and Ministry at Hellenic College Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. She received her bachelor's degree from Villanova University and her master of theological studies from the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Kira's experience in youth work spans 10 plus years and includes serving as staff for her Metropolis Camp, Ionian Village, OCF, and Crossroad, all programs that were part of her own faith formation. Kira has also published articles on the topic of young women's faith formation. They will be bringing to bear their exp experience engaging emerging leaders and as emerging leaders themselves. So please welcome everyone and first foot Father Cosmas. Thanks everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it's nice to be here. I wanna take a moment to thank all of the organizers of this event. Holly, thank you for your leadership. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, it truly has been a, a seamless event and seamless for at least our family to come and be here this, these couple days, these hours that we have together. Um, before I begin, um, I just wanna say a few things about myself that were noted. Um, everything I'm about to offer here, um, I'm offering to you as a student of youth and young adult ministry, as someone who's still learning a lot as he goes. Um, my experience primarily has been at the parish setting and now at our diocese or metropolis regional setting. Um, but I'm really excited to spend a few moments to share with you about this idea of come and see, being um, a model that we have to turn from um, and go and see the lost sheep when we talk about emerging our, engaging our emerging leaders. I also wanna say that um, everything I'm about to say, I'm not really saying necessarily to you but I'm say, speaking more in terms of um, how I have learned about the culture of our church in the United States and ways that all of us together can hopefully make some changes in terms of engaging these leaders. So I am not telling you <laughs> some sort of wisdom that I think I have to tell you in as much as identifying um, some problems that we together, I think, can solve in terms of engaging our emerging leaders. Um, and so let's, let's dive in. We're gonna spend, I don't know, about the next 30 minutes at max uh, with me just you know, helping you all fall asleep gently after your lunch. <laughs> I feel like whoever speaks after lunch gets to say that, you know, it's kinda nice. Uh, and then after that, we'll, we'll bring up some all-star um, ministry workers to um, kind of answer some questions and engage this conversation from their experience, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so let's just start with this question for you. Um, just think about this for a second. How did you find your leadership? Or maybe another way to say it could be, how did you become the leader that you are today? What started you in your leadership? Think about that for 30 seconds. Why did your leadership begin? Does anybody want to share? Why did your leadership begin? What caused it to begin? Steve? Oh, go to the mic, yeah. Uh, 
kind of an accident. A friend of mine, uh, was, our mutual friend Nick Leonis, was, now father Nick Leonis, was, uh, was seeking a position at the Archdiocese. And after Vespers at seminary, he introduced me to the guy who was in charge of the department at the time. Um, so that was it. It was like a, just a random conversation after Vespers. Thanks. Anybody else? Go to the mic and, yeah, please. Because I didn't know any better, <laughs> I uh, had applied for a history position with a charter school organization, and they said, well, we're looking for headmasters. Would you like to lead a school? And I just finished up my master's degree and thought, oh, yeah, I can go lead a school. Well, they waited until after they hired me to tell me that the school was going to be in an economically disadvantaged area where they had never heard of classroom education before. Um, so I basically had to you know, see the limits of what I didn't understand and, and get in there and just get my hands dirty. So a little bait and switch, is that fair? It was a little <laughs> bit of a bait and switch, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. But it taught me, you know, I was thrown in and I had to learn all these, these things yeah. that I didn't know how to do. Yeah. So that was the best the best you know, baptism by fire I think I could have received. That's great, yeah. Online, Evelyn Clune is saying, I'm returning the skills God gave me back to the church. I spent 17 years in corporate America and leadership roles, and now she's working in the church. Nice, okay, great. All of you, in some, for some reason, you became a leader. Um, maybe someone invited you. Maybe you tripped and fell into it. Maybe it was a bait and switch. I just want you to keep that at the front of your, of your mind today as we go through um, this conversation here. And so speaking about engaging emerging leaders, um, just two more questions for you to think about. Um, what does engaging emerging leaders mean to you? And there's a couple of follow-up questions to unpack that. Who would an emerging leader be to you? And what does it mean to engage them? Right, who is the, who is the person we're engaging and in your mind, what does it actually mean to even engage them? Something for you to think about as well. And so as we move forward here, um, I want to kind of do three things. Um, number one, I want to frame the problem. I think we're well aware of the 60% leaving the church, but I want to frame the problem more acutely towards our leaders, our emerging leaders. I want to talk about a model shift that we can consider and then I want to talk a little bit about the experiences, the limited experiences that I have um, in engaging these emerging adult leaders. So let's frame the problem first. What specifically are we trying to solve? And I think you know a lot about the left column. We know we're losing engagement. We're talking about engaging our emerging leaders. Well, when we talk about all of our emerging people, leaders or not, we know we're losing them. We know about the 60% who are falling away from the church. We know, at least in the GOA, the inverse correlation between baptisms and death. We know that there's a decrease in stewardship across at least the, arch, the Greek Orthodox archdiocese. I don't know the particulars of the other archdiocese. What we need to know too though is what's going on with our emerging leaders? One thing we know for sure is that if we're looking at our brightest and best, the number of 60% it pales in comparison to the percentage of leaders we're losing. We know that the faithful we are losing are still finding the faith somewhere else, meaning they're not now faithless, but they're still craving something, and they're not finding it in this emerging time period of their life from high school into emerging adulthood. And this last point is really surprising to me, and I hope it's something that's an eye-opener for all of us. Stewardship may be decreasing within the United States across the board in American Christianity, but giving is at an all-time high. And you can imagine how many times you've been hit up to become a monthly giver. It's 10 bucks, and we'll give you a T-shirt as well. Am I right? Who hasn't heard that before? And so let's look a little bit at um, this decreased engagement um, that we're facing across the board. The numbers in terms of emerging leaders are staggeringly low. Um, Notre Dame did a study on this and found that only in the Catholic Church, 
we can use them as a pseudo comparison, that only 7% of Catholic Christians still practice their faith actively. 7%, not 40%. Meaning those who are most invested in the church, the leaders, right, the ones who are finding Christ first, as Steve said in his presentation, are maybe 7%. These are those who attend mass regularly, identify strongly with their faith. And the loss time period that they found, which is probably no surprise to you who know this issue of our young people leaving the church, is that 79% of those who left have left by the age of 23. So right at the time period when we're looking to engage our emerging adult leaders is the number one time period that they're leaving. And so when we think about what this problem is and how critical this problem is, we have to consider that we are literally going the opposite direction as we're hoping to, right? We don't, need to, we don't need to redirect, we need to change course, right? We are pulling a Jonah right now, and we gotta, we gotta turn the other way. So let's talk a little bit about why they're leaving. I think we know some of these items, but there's also some other items to bring up. Um, in 2014, the Catholic Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, um, did a survey specifically on this issue of their leaders leaving the church. It was a small survey, a few hundred people, and basically as they, what they did was they took an exit survey of their high school Catholic students. And they didn't only ask them, are you moving away towards the church, but what are the biggest drivers that have caused you to move away from the church? And they came up with a host of reasons but the second biggest reason that 67% of the surveyed emerging leaders found is that they lost interest. They lost interest. Uh, two years later, the Pew Survey Forum did a much larger survey with thousands of people called Faith Flux Challenges in Religious Affiliation in the US. And what did they find? They found for them that the number one reason why emerging adults left the church, 71% of them said because they just gradually drifted. If we want to identify the problem of our emerging adult leaders leaving the church, we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, why on the granular level in Springfield, Illinois, and on the national level of the United States, why are our emerging adult leaders simply drifting away. They are leaving because they are drifting away, meaning they're not leaving in one particular moment, they're, by and large. They're not, by and large, leaving because of one particular person or one particular moment, but because over a course of time, they have not been engaged, they are slowly drifting away from the church. This concept of drifting away um, is something that's really well highlighted in Deacon Michael Hyatt and Daniel Harkavy's book. Um, maybe you've heard of it called Living Forward. It's a book about living with intention. It's a book about our own personal life and how in our personal lives, we can choose to be a boat with a motor that is powering us somewhere, or we can choose to be a boat without a motor that is drifting in the water. Either way, there's motion. Either way, there's movement. However, one has intention, direction, and most importantly, a destination. And the other one is aimlessly staying afloat. There's a really beautiful quote from this book I have up here for you. You can do almost anything if you are willing to clarify your commitments and make incremental, change, incremental investments over time to achieve them. You can do almost anything if you are willing to clarify your commitments and make incremental investments over time to achieve them. I would just say that in my experience, this too can happen at the ministry level. Our ministries can drift. If we don't take the time to make incremental changes over time by making and clarifying our commitments, what we're doing and where we're going and who's going to do those things, our churches, which as we know, our church at large is, is referenced as a boat, can also drift 
and not have that direction taking us somewhere. We have to ask ourselves, all of us, what incremental investments are we making? When do we typically look for that next leader? And how are we allowing our emerging adult leaders to drift in their spiritual journey? I don't know about you, but the number one time that I've noticed church leaders looking for the next leader is about two years later than they should have. Oh my gosh, we have no one to teach sixth grade Sunday school next Sunday. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, you know, right? How can we be much more intentional in how we engage our leaders and incrementally over the course of time bring them into those leadership positions? I guess another way to ask this question is, will they drift? Will they move away if we've helped to make them invested? Up on the screen are eight or nine of the top undergraduate majors in the United States today, in 2021. Business administration, accounting, nursing, psychology, and so on. Please raise your hand if in your work you couldn't use someone who knows business administration or accounting or nursing, or psychology, or communication. We could go down the list. Our emerging adult leaders are already leaders. They are already honing in expertise somewhere. The question for all of us is, are they honing those expertise as well within the context that they could do so in the life of the church? And how are we as leaders identifying that capability and plugging them into a place where they can work? Are we creating the playground, so to speak, for them to play in, for them to do that work? If we give true, incrementally appropriate leadership to our emerging leaders, I think we all can realize that they wouldn't drift. If they had a clear role where they felt that they were helping and offering their expertise, there's no other place that they'd want to be with that free time. It's our calling to strategize into emerging leader engagement and stop drifting into it. We have to think about the incremental ways that all of the young people we encounter and emerging adults we encounter can be plugged in to something and take action and invite them. You know, we said a few things at the beginning. I, I found my leadership by accident. It was a bait and switch. I found it later on in my career. What if instead, in 20 years from now, we asked a group of people, how did you find their leadership? And they said, I was invited. I was brought up level by level. I was empowered to own something that I had a skill set in owning. This has to be the destination we're headed for, that it, there's much more intentionality and most importantly, an invitation. I share with you a photo, hopefully you can see it on the big screen, of the leadership team that runs our summer camp. It's called Fanari Camp. And you see a bunch of smiling faces and I could tell you a story about every single one of them. These young people were able to lead our camp this year. Actually, one of the sessions this summer, Anna and I were not there. We had to leave for an, another camp we were working on. And they were able to navigate struggle. They were able to navigate COVID. They were able to deal with uh, the psychological issues of some of the campers and even some of the staff. Why? They were given the tools to focus on their area of expertise, and they were given the opportunity to then do so in a ministry context. Some of these young people and former campers, now counselors, said to us in our leadership team meetings, I don't know if I should be meeting in this room at this level. They, they didn't realize that they could be invited to the table of taking the lead and doing really important work in the lives of our campers. And so I want to offer to us, not only identify the problem, but see the potential in our young people, an opportunity to flip the switch here. If I were to offer just one thing for us to consider today, it seems that our experience of the church has been much come and see in the last 50 years or maybe all of our history in the United States. We built buildings all over this country and we've invited people to come within those walls 
and worship and do ministry and grow and be, and be baptized, married, and buried within the walls of the church. And that's obviously a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. But I think it's a model that lacks also the desire for us to find the lost sheep. We just went over the data of, we know that young people are leaving the church, our emerging leaders even at a higher rate are not engaging with the church. We can no longer ex expect our emerging leaders to fall into our lap. I don't know about you, but how many times I have heard, I don't know where the young adults have gone. I don't know where they went. If we're speaking about the culture of our church, I don't mean the ethnic culture of our church, but the mindset of orthodoxy in America. I don't know if there's any statistic that can help us understand how we think about our emerging adult leaders than this, um, from a study from Alexi Krindach in 2017 called Young Adults and Young Adult Ministries in American Orthodox Christian Parishes. He assessed all, all jurisdictions, excuse me, of orthodoxy, and he found this. The vast majority of clergy, 71%, 71% of Orthodox clergy across all jurisdictions in the United States believe that the greatest problem in ministering to young adult members are the young adults themselves because they have little interest in participating in parish life. I'm gonna read that one more time. 71% of Orthodox clergy in the United States believe the greatest problem in ministering to young adult members are the young adults themselves because they have little interest in participating in parish life. This was in 2017. I don't know about you, but in terms of leadership, there couldn't be a more backwards mindset of our leaders. If you know even the basics about leadership, I know you all do, the number one thing a leader does when they fail is look in the mirror and wonder what did I do incorrectly? How can I be better. So if we want to talk about a cultural shift in how we engage emerging adults, we need this statement as soon as possible to be completely flipped. That all of our Orthodox church leaders think the reason that young adults are leaving the church is because we haven't done enough to go and find that lost sheep. We haven't done enough to engage them. Because giving still at an all-time high. Because Non-church goers are still faithful people. And because they have skill sets and talents that they are so much desiring to offer the church, but they're just needing an opportunity to do so. We need to move away from the come and see only and move toward finding the lost sheep as our mindset in how we engage emerging adult leaders. And this is Christ's example. I mean, if you look at the calling of Christ, of most of his disciples, it doesn't say that he was sitting down somewhere and they came and he said, oh, cool, join my team. I mean, we can look, I'm not gonna read these examples in their entirety, but when he calls uh, his first disciples, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee. They are on their boats doing their profession when Christ calls the first called. And going on from there, he sees this, the Zebedean brothers and invites them as well. He is out finding them in their profession and then inviting them to follow him. The same is true with the calling of Philip and Nathaniel. Christ is not sitting and waiting for them to show up and fall in his lap, but rather he is going to where their world is happening and then inviting them personally into his ministry. This example that Christ gives us and how he invited his emerging young adult leaders, for they were young adults themselves, has to be the way that we think about how we engage our own emerging adult leaders. It's vital for our emerging adult leaders, but it's also vital for, vital for our church. It's vital for them, and it's vital for us. It's vital for us, I think, in so many ways, because most importantly, we have a big problem 93% of our emerging adult leaders are not engaging with the church right now. That is not a good rate of return on our investment. Maybe we need to increase our investment in them. And Dan Sullivan's book, Who Not How, a great book, by the way, on delegating. He points out 
how President Kennedy was able to put a man on the moon by casting the big vision. As you know your history, well, he wasn't even alive when man first walked on the moon, but he cast the big vision and then invited the expertise of those engineers, scientists, astronauts to figure out how to do it. We as church leaders, if we wanna cast a big vision for what our church could be in the world, in our communities, we have to communicate it. We have to cast that vision to our emerging adult leaders and then invite them in to do something as unbelievable as walking on the moon was in the 60s. It's vital for our church to grow. Engaging our emerging adult leaders, though, in this find the lost sheep way is also vital for our emerging adult leaders themselves. In Daniel Siegel's book, The Power of Showing Up, he notes, seeing our kids means we ourselves need to learn how to perceive, make sense, and respond from a place of presence and to be open to who they are and who they are becoming. Not who we would like them to be and not filtered through our own fears or desires. The power of showing up in the lives of our emerging adult leaders is just the same. It means that we see them for who they are, what they have to offer, and then invite them in and truly equip them to realize that same value that they can bring to the world can also be brought into the church. I share this photo with you uh, on the celebration of the enthronement of our hierarch, His Eminence Metropolitan Nathaniel, because I think he very much, when he entered our metropolis about three years ago, really saw our emerging adult leaders and valued them. This photo actually was taken um, immediately after he gave his um, speech at the enthronement banquet. And immediately after, he came down from the banquet table and a lot of people were trying to go and huddle around him and you know introduce themselves to him. But he saw our group of YAL Chicago, our, our young adult ministry leaders, and he said, oh, wh where are the young adults? That's what he said. And then once he found them, Ian, the guy right in the front there taking the selfie, he goes, his eminence said, oh my God, let's take a selfie. <laughs> and the smiles you see on the faces of these young adult leaders was not just because they were taking a photo, it was an affirmation that their way of taking a photo, a selfie, was known. That being in the photo and finding them first was important. They were affirmed that their work and their value in the church was meaningful and purposeful just by virtue of him taking 30 seconds to seek them out and to take a selfie with them. These small ways of finding the lost sheep have boundless impact in their self-value, desire, and worth in the context of the church. And so what's at stake here? I think as we consider when we engage our emerging adult leaders and when we consider going out to find the lost sheep, we have to remember this. We need to cease to fit emerging leaders into our ministries, but we need to rather find the ministries that fit our emerging adult leaders. We need to stop saying, oh my gosh, I have no sixth grade Sunday school teacher next Sunday. Of course, I'm not saying we don't need Sunday school, by the way. Although, actually, that's another conversation. <laughs> but I am saying that we need to be thinking about what way can this person, this emerging adult in front of me, this icon of Christ, with what they have to offer, how can they fit in to this puzzle of the ministries we're trying to do in our respective archdiocese, metropolis, parish, whatever level you're working on, versus, oh my gosh, I have this hole this, that I need to plug, right? All of these emerging adult leaders have so many talents, and all we have to do is literally see them and say, I can see exactly where you will fit into this greater puzzle. We have to stop waiting for them to come and fill that hole, but rather go out 
find them and engage them with the way that they can engage with the church using their own skill sets. We need to find and develop ministries that fit them. If our ministries are just something that we keep on doing and perpetuating, as Steve said in his talk earlier today, but not things that are changing and innovating, how do we expect them to stay engaged? How do we expect our ministries to nuance to their reality and the world that they're living in here and now? They are actually the ones that could inform the change needed within our ministries right away. So once we engage them, oh, I think I clicked the wrong button here. Okay. Once we engage them and once we bring them on, we then need to give them the keys. And Anna will talk a little bit more about the keys. I realized that yesterday when we looked at each other's slideshows, so I won't say too much about that. <laughs> this is a little callous family afternoon for you all. Sorry about that. Um, but once we find the ways that our emerging adult leaders can do something, once we've gone and found the lost sheep, what do we do? We need to give them the ownership to do so. We have to let them then play. We've gotten them, we've identified the playground, we've invited them to the playground, we need to put them in the playground and let them play. And that is exactly something that I learned a lot about, not on purpose, but by accident, with our young adult conference. Right after, just to share a quick story, right after I became our Metropolis Youth Director, which was in 2019, that summer, a super energetic young adult named Dimitri Vlahakis called me up and said, Father, we're bringing back the Y'all Conference. We're gonna have 500 kids. I was like, Dimitri, we need to talk about realistic expectations really quick. He's like, no, no, Father, we're gonna do it. Dimitri, by the way, is the guy all the way, right here, that's Dimitri right there. He said, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. I said, okay. By the way, this was like the end of the summer and he wanted to do it in February. I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, can we do this? I don't know. He's like, Father, I'm gonna make a budget and we're gonna do it. And I was like, you know what? Let's do it. I had no idea what a y'all conference could look like, should look like. I had no idea what, how many kids would come. I had no idea how we would even do it, but we did it. We invited this group, this team of young adult leaders from our metropolis, from college, and some of them early in their profession, and said, guys, we're gonna work together to reestablish something. We're gonna, we're gonna establish it f around Christ. We're gonna have wholesome workshops and speakers, and we're gonna have a ton of fun, and we're gonna bring our young adults together and bring them together around the axis of Orthodox Christianity, and we did. And of course, Dimitri was right. We had like 500 kids there, which is great. But more importantly, we had 500 kids come and engage their faith in a specific way. But most importantly, it was executed completely by this team of young adult leaders. We identified what we needed. We invited young professionals who could do, do those tasks. And then we gave them the ability to do so. If we want to engage our emerging Orthodox leaders, we have to give them the keys to run those ministries. In order to do so, we have to know the keys that we have. In other words, what are the capabilities, power, and access that we have in our circle, in our ministry? And then we have to be intentional about giving those keys to the appropriate people at the appropriate time, which Again, Anna will talk a little bit more about this concept of keychain leadership. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Everyone can hold a key. Everyone can hold a key. We have to be willing to give the appropriate keys at the appropriate time to the appropriate people. As we wrap up here, um, I just wanna make a few final points. Um, number one, I want to just say, when we look at those statistics that I mentioned in the beginning, first and foremost, our urgency as leaders cannot be greater. We have to shift the way that we engage our emerging adults immediately and encourage those who are of that 71% of clergy that it's the young adult's fault that they're leaving. We have to shift that mindset as quickly as we can. 
Second, we must architect our emerging leaders' involvement and not drift. What ways are your ministries drifting? I have some ministries that are drifting too, it happens. In what ways are your ministries drifting and how can you put in a structure to bring in the right people at the right time to lead them? And then finally, we must tailor our ministries to fit our emerging adult leaders and not try to tailor our emerging adult leaders to fit the ministries that we have been perpetuating. We have to make that change. These are the keys if we want to engage our emerging adult leaders, at least from my perspective and from my experience, my limited experience. And so finally, um, I just want to share with you this photo of three awesome people, Tatiana, Nick, and Bella, who are three emerging adult leaders right now in our, in our two of them are on the East Coast now, and, and Tatiana's in Chicagoland. And they were some of our first Goyans when, when we started at the parish level. And you'll notice they're wearing a pretty cool um, and probably illegal Vineyard Vine knockoff shirt, because I don't think we got... I don't think we got permission to use the Vineyard Vine whale uh, that you see uh, on the, shirt, the shirts they're wearing. Um, but there's a beautiful story about, in my opinion, maybe the best way that I've learned about engaging emerging adults happened when the three of them, and one more who's not pictured named Mary, graduated from Goya. They finished their Goya season. They graduated from, um, they graduated from Sunday school. I don't even think they got a prayer rope. Not that that would have necessarily been beneficial. <laughs> but I remember Nick in the middle, um, I think we had a barbecue with them or something, and Nick said to me, um, Father Kay, so what's next? And I stopped, and I was like, um, in the back of my head, I was like, I have no idea. And then you know what I said to him? I said, you tell me, what's next, Nick? And he said, let's start Goy Alumni. I was like, what's Goy Alumni? He's like, I don't know, but I want to keep hanging out with these people and being a part of our church and doing things. And two years later, not that we created a ministry, because I don't know that that's really the point, but we created space for our graduating high schoolers, emerging college students to continue to have a comfortable place within their parish, to find ways where they could start getting engaged in their leadership, like coming on our retreats, some of them now on our parish council, getting involved within the life of the church. Nick taught me something I didn't realize, that he still needed a clear space in the church and needed more of a baton pass before he was ready to completely own his own leadership within the life of the church. That's what he taught me. And so we tailored a ministry within the context of this particular parish at this particular time to engage just that need. And they also designed those really cool shirts too, which is great. As we, in closing, think about engaging our emerging adult leaders, I think the greatest thing we can own is that there's so much potential. There's so much hope. We've never lived at a time with more talented, educated, capable, innovative people ever. And if we invite them, if we find that lost sheep, we absolutely will get an exciting response most of the time in a tailored way that they can engage the church in their own way, in their own time, and with their own skill set. Thank you for listening. I want to invite now Kira and Thomaida up to um, join us for our panel. Um, we're going to hear from the two of them a little bit and hear from our online questions. Holly, do you want to do questions first? or should we, I think we can do questions for all three of us, possibly. Um, and then we can... And so I think to kick off the panel, I, I, I kind of want to start by asking a question of the two of you so that everyone in this room and everyone in the virtual Zoom room can kind of contextualize your, the two of your experiences. And then I think that would be a nice way for us to transition into questions from everyone, possibly. Does that sound good? Um, so if the two of you could just share with us here and with the Zoom rooms, um, what is your, give us a quick snippet of what you do <laughs> and what, you ha what your ministry experience has been, and what have you found in your experience in terms of um, engaging emerging adult leaders? 
whoever can go first. Sure. We're going to be passing the microphone. Hi, everyone. I'm Kira Limbarakis. I have been working for the Crossroads Summer Institute for the past eight years. It's an academic theological uh, summer program for high school juniors and seniors at Kalana College Holy Cross. It's a pan-Orthodox program. Hopefully, most of you know of it by now. If not, I'd love to talk to you about it. So there are a couple of different ways in which we, we engage our emerging leaders. And I would say um, there are a few different stories that come to mind. Um, and the invitational piece is critical. So part of our Crossroad ministry is we actually have a whole host of initiatives and programs that we run for our alumni. Um, so our high school students graduate from the program. They are so on fire for their faith. They're so excited to go back to their parishes. And unfortunately, a lot of times they end up feeling a little disappointed when they go back because they don't feel like they have a place where they can either, you know, chant at the chant stand um, or their questions maybe aren't taken very seriously, which is a big part of the Crossroad program. It's we take their questions very seriously. We invite them to ask questions, to share their learnings with their peers. Um, but uh, this was an idea that emerged actually from one of our alums, and another one is here. Is there were a couple of alums sitting down in a, in a dorm room and decided that they wanted to do more for the alumni community and came up with the idea of creating an alumni advisory board for our Crossroad alumni community. And it was totally like alumni generated. And at the time, uh, Dr. Ann Bezaridis, who um, is the director of the larger office that hosts Crossroad, she said, yeah, run with it. And since then, um, I think one of the most beautiful things about our alumni advisory board, who we really see is, you know, some of the, the alums who emerge as, you know, folks who want to take on more leadership responsibility, is we really give them the reins. Every year, the board changes. And it's a little scary on the administrative side of things that programs and ministries totally change because I, you know, I like structure and, you know, I'm aware of the realistic expectations of how it takes for things to get done. But I am amazed every single year with our alumni board when they come up with ideas to redo the whole uh, alumni website because we have some really like kind of tech nerds on our board and they're, they were really into coding and I was like, okay, it's gonna be a lot to manage, but go for it. You know, they were really excited about the idea of starting an alumni website. Um, I think one of the other things that um, in addition to kind of honoring their gifts and, and matching them with the leadership opportunities and ministries that excite them and energize them is really just seeing them for who they are and the gifts that they have. So I can think of a number of examples where, um, especially during the pandemic, um, we hosted some virtual open mic nights. Um, that's a big thing at Crossroad. We really love music and art and creativity. And we always do an open mic night on the last night of the program when they're in high school in the summer. And there were a couple of alums who I hadn't seen in years. They didn't come to any of the retreats. They didn't respond to any of the surveys or write for our alumni magazine. But I knew that they loved music and I knew that they loved poetry. And so it had been five years since I saw this one alum. His name was Cliff. He's on Spotify. He's really great. You should check him out. <laughs> and, um, I just said, you know, it's a shot in the dark. Haven't seen him. I know he hasn't really engaged very much in other ministries. And I just messaged him and I said, hey, we're doing a virtual open mic night. I know you, you know, you were an incredible. I remember at open mic night, so like showing him, I remember you. I remember the gifts that you had. I would love for you to perform at our open mic night. You know, please come and join. And he responded in five minutes. And this is, you know, Facebook Messenger, which I don't even think most people use anymore, at least young people use Facebook Messenger anymore. Um, and he came and he was so energized to be with this alumni community online, you know? So it wasn't even um, the opportunity to connect in person, but I remembered his gifts. We, as a staff, we remembered his gifts and we invited him. And I think that that's just a big part of engaging emerging leaders is, is the invitation and the recognition of their gifts and saying, we need them. The church needs them. Our alumni community and our church needs to hear your music. 
um, needs to take advantage of your skills as a as someone who's into coding. Um, so those are just like a couple anecdotes for how, how we do that at Crossroad, but there are so many stories I feel like over the years and also many ways in which I know we have failed and I have failed, so there's still a lot of learning to do. So I'm the Director of Missions and Evangelism for the Metropolis of San Francisco. I got into this job because um, right out of college I was identified, well about a year after I graduated, I was identified um, by my priest um, and um, somebody that actually I got to know through because uh, I started OCF while I was in college in Portland and um, we got to know all the area clergy because they would come and so one of the priests was hiring at his parish that was their first ever parish administrator role that they were going to be having because they um, had been in existence for only like five or six years and we're like okay we need to finally bring some staff on and he um, he recognized something in me that I didn't know was there and invited me to apply for that job and I worked um, in the parish for eight years and got to know so much about you know, parish administration, starting a parish from scratch, like how to um, manage volunteers, a lot about church tours and bringing people into the faith and catechizing people because it was, that was the reason we were started, is to bring new people to orthodoxy in the part of town that we lived in. So um, through, you know, many of the hats that he wore, he um, eventually, uh, he was involved at the missions and evangelism on the, on the metropolis level and then I was invited to um, help with that when they started hiring for that so that's how I ended up working for the metropolis missions and evangelism ministry and um, and have grown into the director role and I've been with the metropolis for seven and a half years now and I would say that so you know in that story you can hear that somebody saw in me some skills and aptitudes and identified those for me before I even had an, a vision for working in the church or an idea of working in the church. But I think um, one of the other uh, things that really helps is that they defined a job description and I think a lot of times what we do is we say like, oh, why aren't young adults involved? And there's so much they could be doing. Like we could use a nurse or we could use somebody with um, marketing communications experience. We don't tell them like what that would look like. We show them the reality of who we are now, our parishes, our, um, this, the state and the culture that we're in right now. And we say, yeah, we could use a lot of help. And they're like, what do you need help with? Is this what you want? You know, we have to give them a vision for what the parish could be, what the church could be, what, we, what it is that we're missing, that we actually share that vision rather than what we are today. So we have to keep communicating a vision. And the other thing I would say is that like working, like I kind of joke sometimes when I was a parish administrator that I did my like, you know how it's like usually like an old lady in the church office. So I said I did my retirement job first, like I flipped my career. <laughs> Um, and I loved it. I mean, it was such a good experience for me. I was so well mentored in that position, and I give a lot of credit to my priest, Father Theodore Dorrance, um, who's on the OCLI board. But um, anyway, I, I think the, the surprising thing to me, too, is that even in this job working with the Metropolis, a lot of people will say to me, you could make so much more money in corporate America. Like, why are you working for the church? And they actually say it to me in the spirit of, like, I don't understand this decision. I almost don't respect this decision. Um, I think you should look for another job in corporate America because you could do a lot better. And I, I'm always kind of surprised because I really believe like this is the most important work that I could be doing. And um, I believe that, you know, to share the, to share the faith is, is the, the greatest almsgiving that can be done. And, um, and so I really feel privileged to work for the church, but I also see that we don't have this culture of saying these are the jobs, this is the vision. I am the only person that I am aware of that is working full time for evangelism for domestic missions. I think I, no other metropolis has a full time person for this. And yet even having one full time person isn't enough, right? There's so much work that has to be done. And then the second thing I wanna say about engaging young people is that one of the things that I do when I talk to parishes about like, okay, what, what can we do to get people excited about evangelism? I say, you need to tell your stories. 
um, I need to tell my story about why I'm still Orthodox because I grew up Orthodox. You need to tell your story about like why you converted to Orthodoxy. This person needs to tell their story about how they stumbled into, into it or what it was like growing up as the child of converts. Like there's a lot of stories and they all need to be shared. And that includes the young people that are emerging adults right now. We need to hear their stories just like um, Steve, you were talking about the podcast that you had. And, and we can all learn a lot by going back and listening to those. And we really need to be gathering and discussing those stories because that's how we know like how somebody ran across orthodoxy and what's keeping them in the church. It's all interesting and it's all the, re like it gives us um, the instructions for what to do next. That's awesome, thank you. Okay, I think um, we're going to turn to questions now. Either if any of you have questions for any for the for any of us really, um, or anyone on the the Zoom. Okay, so one of the big things that's been challenging for me, I, I was received into an OCA parish in the diocese of the South. We had services like seven times a day. And Father Justin was always doing services, confession after or before vespers. Moved to the north and looked around at kind of the liturgical life at some of the places and I was told basically you need to set up an appointment to go to confession. So where is the bridge? You, know, you were talking about going and finding people, but there has to be that accessibility there to where people aren't always like, gosh, I have to reach out to Father so that I can go to confession. Can't I just be like somebody sitting in the church? He's up there hearing confessions. I can just go up there, go to confession. So where is that bridge? Because we're talking about a lot of programs with the young, but I think that the problem is really people my age, adults that are raising children now who are not engaged with their faith. So we're talking about like, yeah, we have to, we have to reach the young, we have to have those programs, but what is being done for the adults who are not being quote unquote catechized in their faith or have fallen away from their faith to be that example? Because in a lot of parishes that I've been in, when those things are being made accessible, those people who may have drifted away are coming back because those things are pulling them back into that. So. so is your question, how do we engage adults in the church? Well, yes, yeah, so, so it's kind of twofold. We're, we're targeting our emerging leaders, but I was talking to some, some gentlemen at, at lunch. We can do all this work to engage the kids, but when they're going home, if they're not getting reinforced at home, then we're just, having to, we're just going in this cycle over and over again. It's like being a principal of a school. We could teach the kids all day long to have virtue, but if they're going home to an environment that's not virtuous, we're just gonna be picking up the same thing the next day. So how do we stop that, you know, that, or how do we engage both those things? Ladies, do you have the crystal ball? <laughs> it's, a big, it's a good question, it's a big I, one. That is a great question, and I, I don't know, like any, like any, problem like in the United States, for example, like you can't just target like education, right? Like education, the failure of education is why all of these other systems are broken, right? It's, it's like a, there's, it's a system. There are a lot of systems at play and there are people in this room who can speak way more to systems change than I can. But um, one thing that I've just noticed, uh, so again, so I, I feel like I will probably answer this totally inadequately. Um, but one of the things, and I'll just share this based on my experience with Crossroad, where we bring in, um, you know, seminary and university professors to teach high school students theology and scripture. And then we bring in, you know, guest speakers to speak on missions and um, public activism, all sorts of things. Um, we really offer them the meat and really try to, um, get them to understand and engage them in the richness of our Orthodox theological tradition. When I first started as the assistant director, my boss said, you should invite your parents to come to Crossroad and like sit in classes for a day. I think it would be fun. <laughs> so my dad, who's a PK, um, and I would consider a fairly you know, knowledgeable person, very devout and very faithful, his mind was blown just by sitting in this one class by Dr. Michael Legaspi on the Old Testament. It was amazing. And he had all of these questions. And he actually stayed after class when the kids were in small group discussions and engaged in a 
really amazing, robust conversation with this professor. And you know, my dad was like 60 at the time. And, and I just really think that for every level of our, of our, of the body of Christ, we just, we need to give meat. We need to give the richness. Um, we need to, um, just take theological education seriously. And, you know, and I say that because the program that I work for is rooted in, in, you know, an academic theological, um, pursuit. So I don't want to like over intellectualize orthodoxy by any means, but I also think we really need to raise the standard for our, um, the types of religious education that we provide. And, you know, is it possible to have uh, an Old Testament scholar at every parish leading, you know, Bible studies? No, it's definitely not. But what can we do to um, create opportunities, I think, for families? And we should probably bring in the um, director of, like, family ministries um, who, who, who studies this on what can we be doing to um, minister to, you know, the little church at home and equipping parents and adults with with the depth that orthodoxy has to offer. And I do think that comes from like deep study of scripture, from our tradition, um, and having people in, like have it be a dialogue, not something you do on your own. Yeah, so I back up everything Kira said. Um, in in ev missions and evangelism, we're really focused on adult education. Um, so it's all we believe that you know the parent is the 24 7 youth director of the child is something that um, father theodore said and i i think it's really brilliant um and i so we're always looking for like how can we educate the adults how we can get the adults you know thinking about their faith and demanding more of them honestly like demanding more and i would even say this with young adult ministry like this is this is the beginning of adulthood like when i was 18 i didn't really know that there was like this young adult Thing that's like supposedly 18 to 35 I didn't know that like that's okay now I'm a young adult so it's like training wheels like I no, I was an adult like I had to take responsibility for my faith and I think that um, uh, there's a really great book called um, uh, I forget what it's called but it's by Rodney Stark and it talks about um, the growth of the church in the first centuries and he says, he finds, as he's a sociologist, he's not an Orthodox Christian, but he studies how the, the church grew in the first centuries. And one of the things they found is that an expensive religion is the best bargain, meaning one that demands the most of you. And so people in a pagan society where it's like, oh, well, there's really blurry lines, um, you know, and we can talk about our society. There's really blurry lines about, well, this doesn't really require anything. I can be that for a day. I could do this for a day, but they're not requiring me to do anything they're not requiring me to say no to anything else well then you don't commit and you just you you aren't anything but with orthodoxy we give you a whole lifestyle and a toolbox for how to live your life and how to grow spiritually and a lot of our orthodox christian adults um, of all ages don't even know about these tools aren't even aware of these tools we haven't really talked about it so just as an example, and this won't work for everybody, especially if somebody, it sounds like some people are getting ready for Sunday school, I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> at our church, we had, um, you know, Orthros Divine Liturgy on Sunday. Coffee moment is what I called it, because it was not an hour, but it was about 45 minutes. And then um, the kids went to Sunday school and the adults went to Theology 101. And what this taught the kids was, hey, it's time for mom and dad to learn too. And the adults would all gather in a circle and sometimes there'd be like a planned topic and sometimes it was literally just like Q&A, but it created a culture of like, this is a learning time, this is an engagement time, look at how my friends are all engaged and asking really good questions. And so it kind of raised the bar and then there are other people that they don't ask any questions at all, but they're learning too. So it really created a culture and I think that's what we have to do is we have to create a culture that we don't, we haven't arrived as adults, right? Like I haven't arrived, I don't know everything about the faith. I am so excited for opportunities to learn more about the faith and, um, and to be with other people who are on fire for that. And that's what keeps us going. So I think we just have to model being lifelong learners and create opportunities to be lifelong learners and look for creative ways to show that to our families too. Mm -hmm. I just want to offer quickly one tool, not a, not in another theory, like uh, just a tool, which is obviously we know the imagery of the church as a hospital. 
how, like if the question is specifically how do we, you know, in, in some sort of a leadership position, one great tool is how are we doing in moments of crisis? Meaning, are, th are we encountering moments of crisis which aren't always necessarily negative, but big change from birth to death? And if not, what can we do to build cl closer relationships with our people? Because those moments of crisis are happening, but they're not being brought to us because we don't have a close enough relationship quite yet with those key people in our, in our church. So just a tool. Online, we have Kathleen, Melanie, and Nicholas watching this all together, and they are asking a question. We, when we go out to find the young adults to use their talents, how do we bring them in and keep them around long enough to make them leaders and actually use their talents? Do we just throw them into the ministry or help build their relationship with the church a little bit first? That's their question. I think it's both end. <laughs> if you're going to engage someone, invite them into the church, forget who's, I, it might have been Steve, I don't know, there have been so many talks this morning, now I'm, everything's kind of getting blurred, but wh why are they here? Why does it matter? Show them that it matters, that their work, helping live stream the service during the pandemic, um, actually has an impact on communities. Why engaging in the liturgy is so critical. Um, yeah, so I think it's, I think it's both. I would say that um, it's it's definitely going to be both, but like there's no harm in just saying like, hey, we need help this weekend. Can you help me? And that um, I remember there's been so many times when I've just asked somebody for help or asked them like um, either I've asked to be mentored, you know, by um, I love make, I love baking. So like there's a woman in my church who makes surakia and she makes a lot for all of her godchildren and I just said like hey I would really like to do this with you would you do this with like could I come to your kitchen and could we do this together super meaningful for me and I think it was meaningful for her too and then other times when I've admitted to somebody like hey I'm in over my head on this event and I really really need help and um and then inviting that person into the space and showing them like how much their contribution helped. And then our friendship became a lot stronger. And then I think our bonds as a church community became stronger. And none of those, you know, from, from e none of the activities were like really theologically based, but they were so community based and, and, um, and important to building up our parish community. So I think, I think it's really important to just start with the project. There's a couple of questions here too about missions, um, evangelism and, and missions. So one question is, how can we move towards a pan-Orthodox unified focus for domestic missions so we don't have to re reinvent, reinvent the wheel in every jurisdiction? Specifically, like, what can lay people do? And then a follow-up question is asking about training material to educate ourselves on how to address missions in the U.S. or abroad, classes or sessions or training materials. So. Okay, those are really big questions. Um, first, I would just, I want to introduce, uh, our website is groworthodoxy.org. If you want to go on there, um, we have a resource library with some things. There's a lot more that um, I'd like to put up there. There's some videos about like welcome ministry. Um, so that's groworthodoxy.org. Um, I am in communication with like other jurisdictions and I do like try to read, you know, the, the other um, books that come out and, and scholarship from other people that are doing evangelism in other jurisdictions. And since it's a pretty small pool of people, we are in communication. So I don't think we're exactly reinventing the wheels, but we are also like working, um, like I am working and reporting to Metropolitan Gerasimos of San Francisco. And so I try to help him in his region. And then I also work with parishes across the country at invitation. So um, anybody that invites me to come and talk about welcome ministry and evangelism, I'm happy to do, to do that. Um, but we are, you know, each like, like I, you know, I can't necessarily tell you what's going to work in the metropolis of Atlanta or the OCA um, diocese of the Midwest. So those are things that are just you know, it's, it's fine, that's the, the way it works, but I think we are really sharing our resources as much as possible, and that there's, you know, more and more opportunities. We have a conference for missions and evangelism that we're trying to do every couple of years, too. And then as far as resources, 
There are some things on the Antiochian website, there's a few things on my website, but um, there aren't really any manuals created yet. A lot of m the most meaningful work I've done with like training people how to do uh, welcome ministry or adult education and things like that have happened through um, webinars or classes. So um, we don't really have any like written manuals that you can just pick it up and do it, but we're trying to teach more and more about that. And that is an area for growth. I'm going to be really mean to all three of you, and I'm going to ask uh, what you think of um, Sunday school. Um, because um, what I'm particularly interested in is that age group that is just before emerging leaders, uh, which in my mind is sort of the high school age, and if you had any insights into sort of engaging that demographic, um, or just any insights in general. Into that group. <laughs> well, Right. You made the comment about Sunday school. No, it's school, fair, so yeah. I'm going to put you on the Yeah, spot. no, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm just speaking from my experience, of course. Um, I think if we look at the Sunday school model um, and how we execute it, generally speaking, um, it has some serious flaws, right? Like the only um, requirement to graduating is registering. You could register, never go to Sunday school, and then you would graduate to the next grade, right? So I'm just saying that we don't really have measurable um, catechetical ways of bringing our kids from point A to point B. Um, additionally, I mean, I think on the parish level, there can be a lot of flaws in terms of bringing kids out of church or, or things like that. I think it's a very high amount of time and energy resources that we put in, and I don't, not only is it my opinion, but there's really no way to show what, what type of um, benefit we're getting from that time and, and resource investment. Um, so that's what I think about Sunday school. I think it needs a lot of work. And, and, and I think it's unfortunate because so many pe really good people who care about kids devote so much time and energy to preparing for Sunday school. So this is not a knock on teachers or Sunday school directors. I think it's more of a model. We try to fit so many things into Sunday, it's crazy. We make our church a Sunday thing. The, about your second question, um, how do we engage the high school age group, the pre-emerging, which I would argue, I'm not saying you're not saying this, but I think they are also emerging adult leaders already. They already have talents to offer the church. Um, in my limited experience, what I've noticed is that we have to get them unplugged. Nothing has been more effective in my limited experience than retreats and camps. When we get our young people away from the crazy hustle and bustle of life and some, in some space and place for a reason, for an amount of time that they've committed to, hey, we need a day and a half of your time and this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna grow together in Christ and then we're gonna end worshiping together. It's much more effective and a better use of time um, from my experience. I, since, so, since I'm not in youth ministry, I don't really feel like I get to weigh in on this question, but I will say for me that um, I happened to grow up in a situation where there wasn't a Sunday school, and so I just want to share that, that like, I don't know, like there's so many ways to educate a child and help them feel connected in the church, and there's so, there's so much more. Um, and I, I've noticed that Sunday school is the thing that we're always going like, but wait, there's a crisis. We need a kindergarten kindergarten teacher, we need a first grade teacher, and there's so much stress around Sunday school. So I'm not sure about what should happen. I really defer to all of you who are professionals in youth ministry. I just, I just really believe that there's hope of, you know, there's different ways of, of um, attacking these problems. So, excellent all around, by the way. Uh, one of the things that I think been implicit in all of your comments is engagement as a process. Right? Engagement is not kind of a one-time thing, but a process. Uh, but I'm wondering, right? Like, is there a way to see um, a no as part of the process? Like, what happens when you actually go look for the law sheet, issue that invitation to the young adults, and the answer is no, right? Because they won't always be a yes. Is there a way to potentially like reframe that? I see that as part of the process. How does one avoid getting discouraged when one makes the effort to sort of like have that one-on-one, -on -one, make the ask, and the no is, is, is in return? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
I'll jump in first. Um, that's a great question. What do we do when we get a no? Well, I think, first of all, we have to expect that, right? Like, and, and so that's an important expectation setting mindset to have. But, I mean, if we're going out to find the lost sheep as our model of engaging emerging adults, that means we're somewhere, possibly outside of the four walls of our church, probably at a cool coffee shop or at a brewery having a beer or a coffee or whatever. And so that no already means that we've made a point of connection with someone on a personal level. And that alone is a huge win in the life of the young person. And being asked that requires the no is also a huge moment for that person. Oh, this church leader thinks I'm capable of doing such and such and I'm unable to. And so I guess, you know, all of that happens before the no and all of that's really only gonna be positive. Um, and then the only thing I would offer is that we take that very, how we respond to that no is critical. We can't be frustrated, I mean, we can be frustrated, but we can't show that you're frustrated about it immediately, right? And so we need to be gracious about it. And then whatever information we receive from that no, because usually it's, uh, it's usually not no, it's usually I would love to, but I can't because, you know, there's a conversation there. F use that, follow up with that. Um, I can't right now because I'm studying for the bar exam. I can't right now because, and not even necessarily to get them to do what you want to do, right? We have to get out of the way, but hey, how'd the bar exam go? We, are, we have started to build a relationship with that emerging adult leader, and that alone will be the open door to them doing something at some point in time. I also think it's really important to um, be very careful with our language and how we respond to a no um, to just ensure that we're not um, creating any sense of like guilt or shame for their inability to do whatever it is that we may be asking or inviting them. Um, even if, and Father Kay, I think you were the first person who shared this with me, you know, if a young adult or a, a youth hasn't been to your parish in a long time, and then they come back all of a sudden, not saying, where have you been? We missed you. You know, which, which actually like sounds, in theory, it sounds kind of nice, we missed you, but the where have you been might actually tell them like, I've noticed you've been gone and I'm disappointed. You know, so how do we just be very conscious and aware of the ways in which we're, we're actually saying like, it's, it's okay, you know? We, we love you, and if you're not able to do this right now, that's okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I just think language is really important. I, I appreciate the question because it's, it's getting my wheels turning, and I'm thinking about my friends and I and different stages of our young adulthood, and I'm thinking about trends like, okay, you know, she always says no to a fellowship event, like just come and we're going to have a dinner for young adults. But she always says yes when we are gonna do a thing at the food bank. Or she says no to um, like game night, but she, she's at liturgy every Sunday. Or she's not at liturgy every Sunday, but she says always comes to game night. Like I think that as long as we're trying to maintain relationship, like I'm not worried about those people. You know what I mean? Like when I think about like, I was really involved in the church in my young adult life, and I should also say that in addition to ministry, it's like I was really involved in parish ministry, and that's always been my workshop, and it still is, of like thinking about how this all works. And um, I, I just think about all my friends, like, well, she, you know, the, her job is more demanding, his is like this, you know, like thinking about everybody's context. We were so close in relationship that we understood each other's context, so you, you didn't, you, you weren't concerned about like, are they still in the church? Because you knew, like, this just isn't his thing. Like, he's just, he doesn't want to sit around and do Bible study. Like, it makes him uncomfortable, but he loves anything where it's physical and we're building something. And I think we really have to respect that and also learn from that and make sure that, like, just because they didn't come to all these, like, really great dinners that we planned, that we're finding other ways to maintain and build relationship with those people. is this at-home involvement, whether that's parental or whoever else is at home, 
how is it that when you're when you're interacting with your young adult leaders or the the younger young adult leaders uh, that you get the home involved in that? Is there is there a method which you, you try to do that with? Is that something that needs to be worked on in the overall scheme of things? And, and how do you get it to where uh, they can engage intelligently with their kid about what their kid is doing? So at the end of the Crossroad program, when the kids go home, like literally the day they get back, we sent out a family survey. So we could very easily just have the kids write their evaluation of the program, but we actually kind of encourage it as a bit of a ministry for parents and guardians to sit down with their child and have them have like filling out the survey collectively as a family so they can share, oh yeah, what did you think about this lecture? And then, you know, the, the parent fills it out, but at least this is how I envision it happening at home because the parent fills it out, but then, you know, they're like quoting their kids. And we have some crosser parents in the room here, so I'd be curious to see if you actually, you know, actually sit down. But I do think that that's just one method. Um, so maybe it's providing, so that's the context of Crossroad. Obviously, you know, for Sunday school, are you, or other ministries, are you able to do formal evaluations at the end? I don't know, but could you send questions um, to the parents um, and guardians afterwards saying, like, hey, when you're at dinner, could this is what we talked about in, you know, in church school today. Would you consider asking some of these questions instead of just, you know, what did you learn? But I heard from your teacher that you talked about X. Tell me, what did you think of it? Were there things that you loved? Were there things that you didn't love? Um, but just really trying to engage them in like communal reflection. I also, I want to add one thing. I, I think, uh, that's really cool, by the way. I want to see the survey. But um, I also think making sure that the arena you have to operate in is super high quality. Like, Mr. Rogers, legendary guy. I've been going down a huge rabbit hole because my son now watches Daniel Tiger. He did not talk to parents. But if you ask parents, he did talk to parents. But he never talked to parents on his program, right? And I think that's true with B2B. How, I, don't, I don't know if you have a data point on that, Steve, if that's possible. But how many parents have learned from B2B? I'm sure, so, of course, it's maybe targeted to a younger audience, possibly, but it's because Mr. Rogers, B2B, it's high quality. Within what they're doing, it's high quality. I think by virtue of being that, it's going to teach everyone that comes into contact with it, right? So sometimes I think it's also just making sure that we focus on doing what we're doing at the highest quality we can. I have one more thought to add to the, the home conversation, if that's okay. Oh wait, I forgot to move on. Um, sorry. Um, I think we, we can also play the long game here. Like just as parents, we're playing a long game with our kids. As ministers, if we're playing the long game with emerging leaders, if you're inviting these young, younger people who are single, who don't have families yet, into your home and letting them pray with your family, letting them see how you parent, letting them come to church with you. And, you know, so like a way, one of these invitations that we've been talking about might not be formal ministry, but it might just be an invitation into your home and into your life because then you're modeling for them what, when their parents, they could they could do when, so they can create the home environments that do support the next round of church ministry. So I know that doesn't ever, that's not really like a solve the problem right now for the parents at home who maybe aren't as equipped. But if you're thinking like in the long term here about the people you can impact, really focusing on young adults is a way to support the family ministry of the future. If that make, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's 100%. Point. We have a question online from Ann Dankert. How can we gently but decisively move to change ideas about children and young people's place in the parish if the priest falls into the, into the statistic mentioned at the beginning of the talk? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Father, you want to take a stab at <laughs> um, Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the more that I've been involved with ministries, the more and more that I've become a fan of data. I just think it helps us really understand our starting point. So if I, if I were in that position myself, I would, I would, in a very respectful way, 
sh you know, show, show statistically speaking some of you know, the, these primary data points about why emerging adults are leaving the church but are not leaving Christian, Christian values necessarily or giving, right? Giving's at an all-time high. Um, and also maybe just emphasize this problem. But I, I don't think I would do any of that before asking them as many questions as I could of that leader. You know, I noticed this. Can you tell me more about why? You know, I, I, none of that will make progress without an authentic relationship with that leader. So I think I would try my best to form an authentic relationship. Because the goal isn't to, to prove that leader wrong or to change their mind. The goal is to engage this demographic of people who we notice are not being engaged, right? And so we have to keep, we can't, we, otherwise we're going to naturally force conflict with, with that leader, right? So I think we need to, you know, focus on, stay focused on the problem, right? That's like a good uh, marriage conflict technique. Focus on the problem, not your spouse, right? And then gently enter into a conversation by asking a million questions to understand where their perspective is and then to share. And then also what I would do is I would prove it. If we believe this works, prove it as much as you can within the leadership you do have, right? If, if you are able to, you know, show that you're eventually it will become objectively true just by virtue of being practiced in whatever particular ministry you're in charge of. Yeah, and I think it was Katrina who mentioned that like 99% of the time people like leaders who don't understand their flock or, or whatever the situation is, it's rooted in fear. So how do you get, how do you get behind the, the opinion, the frustration to the story that might uncover um, you know, a really difficult situation where maybe that priest tried really hard and it just, and felt and feels totally burnt out. I mean, I think that that's legitimate too. So how do you, just kind of expanding on your point, yeah. Father, that there's, there's always a story. It's so yeah. important that we get to the bottom of it with any issue, with any opinion or frustration, et cetera. There's something behind it. And it's our job as leaders to, to uncover that. Okay, I just want to add that I don't think the st stat is saying that the priests, you know, these priests have st hostility towards youth and young adults in the parish. They just don't think that they're not interested. And from our, you know, um, one of the earliest presentations today, we talked about like, well, what, like, there's an intimidation we feel about work working with youth and young adults. That's one of our obstacles, right? So anyway, I think that um, the other thing we really have to do is empower lay ministry. Like, I think one of the things that helped me the most as um, a parish administrator and also like a ministry leader was that instead of saying like oh the priest like he took pastoral counseling so he's the only pastoral person in the parish like I had that adjective applied to many of the things that I did like we need to be pastoral about that or that was very pastoral or let's help let's approach this pastorally together and that was really eye-opening for me because it taught me what that means and that you can be a pastoral um, leader of the Merbears or a pastoral Sunday school teacher or a pastoral choir director. And those are all places where we can engage youth and young adults without being, uh, like, it's not like we have a gatekeeper, right? Like, we, is, we are the ones who are issuing the invitation and, and um, empowering people. So I think that it doesn't really matter if there's a misconception somewhere up there because, like, our job is just to keep making that invitation. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sorry that I missed, had to miss part of it, so maybe I'm being redundant. One thing just to bring from Sister also telling about uh, the need for uh, the people in the parish also, not just in the world, but in the parish, to really have an openness toward um, the young adults and their vocations and their sense of ministry. And just especially in the sense of going toward monasticism, and then being told, oh, you can do all this, you could make so much money, oh, you're young, why don't you get married? You know, all these things, N not really seeing or respecting in the sense of respect, respecting, and uh, so she made that point. And then the other thing, just Kira, I was struck when you said that coming back from Crossroads on fire and then going to the chanter stand and then there's no room at the chanter stand. 
And so I know that this probably sounds completely crazy, but if we're going to be fools, we might as well be fools for Christ. So, uh, and that's our job. Uh, so one thought is, and integrating some of the other things that have been said about expanding and not fitting into what you already have, but follow what is possible. So what if we had, okay, there's no room for you at the Chandler stand on Sunday. What if there is Wednesday Vespers? And what if there were actually a possibility of someone saying, I'm willing to do Wednesday Vespers if you're willing to come and chant? And we've seen this in, in parishes where I was first coming. You say, oh, well, people live far from the church and maybe, but if you ring the bells and you do the prayers, the people come. They come and then you're hitting many birds with one stone because then maybe the community around is suddenly hearing bells and then they can come into a quiet place and there's nobody else there so they're not uh, you know, feeling embarrassed or ashamed and there, there's room for them. And how do you know what can come out of just going forward with what someone wants to do and with their fire for Christ and with their fledgling wish to be at the chanter stand. So, okay, you learn how to do Vespers, and I'll help you, and maybe the chanter will help you even though the chanter will not let you come on Sunday, and then we'll do Wednesday night Vespers. Or we'll, so that's just a, or morning matins. How glorious, and if even one time this happens, if even one place, one parish, one city, one, there's, this happens, you have no idea what can come from this. If you hear the, then, we're, then we really are bringing the church to these shores because that is normal. Normal is we live, we hear the bell, we know there's a service, we go, even on foot, or particularly on foot. And so, forgive me for throwing this out, but what if we could do that? Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to do one last question, or we're at the last minute of our time, so? There was one more question about Crossroad, uh, asking if there might be more regional um, Crossroad events. That is in the plan, yes. Um, is that from a Crossroad alum? <laughs> no, actually, no, it's not. Okay. Yes, I actually am now transitioning roles um, from Crossroad director to director of strategic growth for Crossroad, and one of our plans is to do more regional gatherings for Crossroad alumni and also their friends, too. Um, we really want to open things um, more broadly. Yeah. This is a great comment coming from Zoom from Evelyn. Uh, I've seen clergy who are so burned out from having to go it alone in overall management of the parish that asking them how can we help opens the door and provides encouragement. The ideas of emerging leaders can be offered up the leadership of the parish. Beautiful. I have nothing to add to that. That's a, that's a great way to end our time, I think. <laughs>